because I'm bringing grunge back. Oh. I'm giving my fourth speech on the last great rock band, Pearl Jam. Oh. <laughs> Very nice. I hope to be atorexia today. <laughs> I am glad that I picked today to give my speech because with the theme being the 90s, it gives me a chance to talk about my favorite and one of the most popular and influential bands from that time, Pearl Jam. Pearl Jam, along with Nirvana, Soundgarden, and Alice in Chains, were the driving forces behind the Seattle grunge music explosion. It brought with it an edgier, harder, alternative sound to music listeners compared with that of the popular hair bands of the 1980s. Unlike their band contemporaries, who didn't make it through the decade because of you know, suicide, which Scott had alluded, alluded to earlier, overdose of drugs, and just differences between band members, Pearl Jam was able to stay together through the years and are still going strong to this day. Later this year, they're going to be releasing their 10th studio album and will be going on tour as well during that same time. Today I would like to be talking to you about their early history. Um, <laughs> their refusal to conform to music industry standards and how I became such a huge fan. Pearl Jam rose from the ashes of the band Mother Love Bone after their lead singer had died of a heroin overdose. The surviving members, guitarist Stone Gossard and Mike McCready, and bassist Jeff Amen, needed a new lead singer. After a suggestion from a fellow musician, they decided to go with a singer from San Diego named Eddie Vedder. They then added drummer David Bruzies, and they formed Pearl Jam. They got their start in 1990 with the name Mookie Bela, which was actually an all-star basketball player at the time, but had to change it because of legal issues. <laughs> in August of 1991, they released their first album, 10, which was actually Mookie Bela's number, so it's kind of a coincidence. 10 did not do well at first, uh, sales-wise. But by the middle of 1992, it had been certified gold, and because of Pearl Jam's touring and increasingly popular intense live shows is why it, became, it went gold. Says the producer of Pearl Jam, Brendan O'Brien, once people came and saw them live, this light bulb would go on. During their first tour, you kind of knew what was happening, and there was no stopping it. After 10, the band put out Versus, which was their second album in 1993, and actually broke the record for most sales within the first week of its release. But that was then broken in 1998 by some guy named Garth Brooks. <laughs> <laughs> Over the next 14 years, Pearl Jam would go on to release six more studio albums. With this most recent release, Backspacer, it debuted at number one on the Billboard Music Charts back in 2009. Pearl Jam's early music dealt with dark subject matters such as depression, suicide, teenage angst, and loneliness. These are most notable in songs such as Jeremy, Alive, Daughter, and Rearview Mirror, which also happen to be some of their biggest hits. Go figure. After the success of Ten and Verses, Pearl Jam began making a ton of public appearances such as things as Saturday Night Live, MTV Unplugged, MTV Music Awards, and gave a ton of TV interviews. This made the band members very uneasy and were increasingly uncomfortable with their newfound fame. They didn't know how to handle it. Due to this rapid rise in popularity, Pearl Jam actually refused to make any more music, music videos, despite pressures from the record label and also it being common knowledge that the music video was a vital sales, to, sales tool in a band arsenal to sell records. 
Eddie Vedder relates this to, uh, before music videos first came out, you'd come up with your own visions, these things that came from within. Then all of a sudden, sometimes even the first time you heard a song, it was with these visual images attached. It robs you of any self-expression. After that, Pearl Jam also sued Ticketmaster after they had learned that they added a surcharge to tickets that they sold, and Pearl Jam was afraid that they were going to price out the average concert goer. They actually testified before Congress in Washington, D.C., in front of a subcommittee on this issue and Ticketmaster's strategies of monopoly and anti-competitiveness to gouge fans. Um, <laughs> this almost killed their career because Pearl Jam refused to play at venues that were contracted with Ticketmaster. Wow. And they didn't play in the U.S. for nearly three years. They eventually dropped their lawsuit and in 1998 started touring again in Ticketmaster venues and across the U.S. in places like Madison Square Garden and the Forum in L.A., which is no more. As Pearl Jam grew, they experimented with their sound, which kind of drove some casual fans away, but real Pearl Jam fans stayed true. The last few albums have dealt more with reflection than about revolt and their, and their comfortableness with their level of fame. I began listening to Pearl Jam at the ripe old age of 11 years old when my older cousin introduced them to me. As soon as I heard them, I fell in love, and I ran home and begged my mom to buy me the 10 album. As I've gotten older, I've started to really listen to their lyrics and the messages that they tried to convey, and it made me appreciate them even more. Although I truly did not understand what the band was really about until I got to see them live for the first time when I was 16 at Madison Square Garden. This was really a truly magical experience to see them live and in person and on stage and to get that intimate feel of band and concert goer. I have seen them five times since and have never been disappointed and they have truly played every show like it's their last. They're one of those true bands that have the marathon show with at least two and a half hours. They'll play 30 songs and with encores and really give you your money's worth. Pearl Jam has made a lasting impression and influenced a number of bands. They've been praised for the refusal of rock star excess and have stayed true to themselves and their fans without wavering on their beliefs and ideas, ideals on how their band should be run. And I'll leave you with one of my favorite lines from a Pearl Jam song. He who forgets will be destined to remember. Thank you. All right.